So the difficulties that some countries experienced after the adoption of the euro were actually based exactly on the fact that they were quite different to begin with. But uh, basically what the ECB does is a central bank like the Fed, it prints the euro and it channels the euros throughout the system to all parts of Europe. And so until people uh, get full confidence, you will hardly see a recovery, a full recovery taking place. So even if we have a vaccine, people will still be fearful of doing certain activities. I think recovery is going to be bumpy with lots of setbacks and I'm afraid it's going to be long because confidence will need uh, will need some time before being restored both for consumers and for business. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Mario Draghi. Mario served as president of the European Central Bank from 2011 till October of last year. As president, he is widely credited for saving the euro and deftly managing the eurozone debt crisis. Prior to his service at the ECB, Mario served as governor of the Bank of Italy and as chairman of the Financial Stability Board. Mario, welcome to the podcast. Every time we talk, I learn something. So let's get started. Let's start at the beginning. Talk a little bit about your early life. Economics isn't something you just learned in school. It's in your blood. Your father worked for the Bank of Italy in Rome. How did your upbringing shape your thinking and the choices you made throughout your career? Oh, thanks, Hank. I, I have a great uh, debt of gratitude to uh, both my parents, as a matter of fact, but as far as the choice in economics, mostly to my father. He was from Venice. Oh, by the way, they both died when I was uh, quite young. But in spite of that, the messages they managed to pass through to me and to my sister and my brother, I believe stayed with us all, all our lives. Uh, so... Uh, he was he was originally an accountant and a teacher when he first came to Rome when he was in early 20s. Then he became a bank supervisor working for the Bank of Italy. And then he went to work following the crisis of the 1930 where all the banks and the major industries were all bankrupt. And what the, the government created a very large state-owned conglomerate called IRI. At that point in time, it was a very large industrial power and financial power. And he went to work for that. I, th- I believe it was, must have been 1932. And then there, he became what uh, we would call today an investment banker. He was financing funding, mostly hydroelectric projects at that time. Both, uh, he was doing this job in Italy, but also outside Italy, in uh, Germany, Hungary, Austria. And then after the Second World War, he became a commercial banker. So I'm saying this because very often our evenings were focused on uh, discussions about, mostly about uh, politics first. Uh, my mother was, uh, was really um, holding her values in, in politics. You know, both of them had to live through fascism and uh, they were, uh, my father was not uh, basically affected by it because he was a, what you would call today a war hero during the First World War. So he was respected and, uh, and he could not be basically affected by what was happening. And my mother was much younger, of course, but they all had their, their views. And so we had lots of discussions or conversations about politics and economics. Now, economics was clearly looming large in all our conversations so that uh, after their death, when I had to choose what to study as an undergraduate, well, we don't have exactly the same uh, system. So our choice that uh, when we are in our late teens has to decide which subject you want to take. So I didn't have much hesitation and I uh, I choose economics, and I've stayed with that forever. 
yeah, you, and we're all grateful for that. But let me ask you, how old were you when you lost your parents? My father died when I was uh, 15 years old. And my mother died when I was 19. Wow. But, you know, the, the fact was, in fact, as far as my father was concerned, uh, he was born uh, way back, uh, so in 1895. So I had uh, the privilege, in a sense, of a completely different message from someone belonging to an entirely different generation. And um, at the same time, of course, the cost of this was that our friendship was, in a sense, didn't last long. Well, it was quite an impactful childhood. So let's now move on along. And, uh, you know, you and I worked together during the 2008 financial crisis. And I got to see your excellent work as head of the Financial Stability Board when you made very practical recommendations on the need for international coordination. Then, of course, as head of the European Central Bank, you received universal plaudits for successfully shepherding the European Union through the financial crisis and more than once avoiding imminent catastrophe. I want to talk about your experience there, but first for listeners who are not, may not be as familiar with the European Central Bank, tell us a bit about the ECB, why it is important for Europe and for the global economy, and, and what is it? Thanks, Hank. By the way, I too have a very fond memory of our work together at that time. About the ECB, it's like the Fed. Let me step back for a moment and say one word about uh, the euro. The difference with the United States is that before, until uh, the end of the 80s, early 90s, all European countries had their own currency. And then they decided in what was probably one of the most uh, one of the historical steps in the European construction, they decided to put all their currencies together and create this new currency, the Euro. There are many reasons for this step, which I, well, I, I don't think uh, they're worth discussing now because that's it's past. If you, if you want, I can say a few things about that, but, uh, but basically that it was, it was widely justified by lots of reasons even though the countries were still very different. So the difficulties that some countries experienced after the adoption of the Euro were, were actually based exactly on the fact that they were quite different to begin with. But uh, basically what the ECB does is a central bank like the Fed, it prints the Euro like the Fed prints the dollar and it channels the Euros throughout the system through the usual channels, mostly the banking system, to all parts of Europe. There is, however, a big difference. The Fed has a federal budget, has a federal government, has many federal agencies around it. The ECB is what I think is the only federal European entity in Europe. You have the Commission, the European Commission, of course, they are also a federal institution, although they are not elected. But basically, the most important one, as far as the currency is concerned, is the European Central Bank, which we call ECB. And it does monetary policy, like the Fed. We do interest rate changes, QE, like the Fed. And uh, frankly, now we can say that uh, the number of tools that the Central Bank has is about the same as the Fed. Yep. And you needed to break new ground because to have a Fed where you've got different political systems is a whole another level of complexity. So I want to go now to the crisis. I remember well, because I was a civilian now, I'd left government. I remember well the seminal moment in July 2012 when you committed to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. What was the threat you were facing and what gave you the courage to utter those words? And what was your thinking? Take us back to that moment and explain what was going through your mind, the threat you were facing and why you decided to make that statement. Well, I think there wasn't much of a calculus behind this. 
there, were, there had been months, obviously, of thinking about the uh, situation which was deteriorating. And so it was, I mean, it looked like a, a one-way bet uh, the markets had gone into. Uh, so the euro could only, could only uh, disappear, basically. That was the bet that many markets had done. And uh, at the time when I spoke uh, in London, this seemed to be almost the point of no return. And I have, I frankly had decided that based on data, based on conversations, based on lots of work with the staff of the ECB. And so then one reflection I remember crossed my mind was that if we don't do this, it's our mandate is to keep price stability. But if we lose our currency, there is no price stability. There is no mandate that we should comply with. And so that, that inspired the very short talk. It was something like less than three minutes or something about that time, I don't remember, where uh, basically the perspective changed. Until then, the European Central Bank never or well entered into purchases of government bonds already had done that, but under completely different conditions. And the message was somehow undermined by the market's assessment of credibility. This time it wasn't so. And um, with much, much uh, effort, the governing council followed this lead and delivered what was basically a transformational change for uh, the euro, for Europe and for the European Central Bank. You know, it's interesting because, of course, the euro is the currency. But when you made that statement, I looked at the currency as being a proxy for the whole European Union. Because if the currency failed, the union would break apart and it would have been a disaster. Probably. Fortunately, we were never there. But it would have been a, a quite a, a tragedy, especially if we, I mean, if we look at what's happening now with Brexit, you can see how difficult it is to disentangle a country from the union and they didn't even have the currency in common with, uh, with the rest of Europe. So it, it would have been a, a situation very, very difficult to manage. But uh, basically what I, in a sense, what, when I hinted at the fact the overall situation is much more complex in Europe than in the United States because we don't have a federal government as a counterpart. That is one of the reasons why it was so difficult to convince markets at the beginning that this would be a credible change in monetary policy because no. we had many national governments facing it. And some of these governments, frankly, were not in agreement with, uh, with this step. I remember it well, and we averted, you averted, helped avert a nightmare. Now yes. let's talk about the big issue of today, the pandemic. You've talked about the burden the pandemic will place on young people. I too believe generational equity is a huge problem we're, we're facing today. How should we think about this? What should we be doing differently? Well, you know, I think that by and large, the response, the economic response all over the world has been in, uh, in the right direction. I don't think there is much of an alternative now than uh, simply uh, issuing debt and uh, uh, monetizing it in the sense that central banks are buying this debt and support the people, the economy, the corporates, so this increase in public debt is, I think, unavoidable. And actually, it's the right thing to do now. Part of this debt will be monetized, I'm pretty sure, forever. Because the, the alternative is between what we are doing today and massive defaults everywhere. By the way, defaults are happening anyway. But, and unemployment will certainly go up anyway. But the government's action so far have prevented a much, much bigger disaster. So part of this, as I was saying, will be monetized. Uh, part of this, however, will very likely be transferred 
on the people who could actually pay for it. And it's not uh, you or me, but it's the people who are very young or young today. So the very least we can do for them is to make sure that they are equipped with skills that could make them able to pay for this debt. So in everything I say or think, I think education is a fundamental action of any government program anywhere in the world. But the third dimension that will help us to get out of this is growth. And uh, so any action that creates growth, that creates employment, uh, is also important, not only by, for itself, for its own sake, but also for debt sustainability. So how do you look at the U.S. response to the pandemic and how does it differ from that of Europe? I think, uh, well, it's very difficult to compare uh, for one reason. Europe has a, a, a very extensive both healthcare system and welfare system. Uh, healthcare is mostly, I think almost everywhere in Europe is, first of all, it's financed out of the government budget and it's free and it's accessible to everybody. Welfare system means that people have automatic access to uh, subsidies, all kinds of variety of different subsidies for unemployment insurance. But then there is a difference between uh, what Europe did and what the US did. Uh, Europe, in most countries, I believe, issued a prohibition to lay off. So companies are now compelled to keep the workers, keep the employees. And of course, these employees will receive the subsidies and the company as well will receive subsidy. Now, at some point, this, uh, this prohibition will have to be lifted. Some said the end of the year, some others said the first quarter, the end of the first quarter next year. And then we may see actually what happens to the labor market. In the United States, companies, corporates were left free to lay off people. But at the same time, the subsidies that these people got, if I am correct, are quite higher than anything that was budgeted in Europe. So if we compare only the amounts that have been budgeted, uh, which is probably not right, but if we compare only the amount that have been budgeted after the crisis, after the COVID-19, my impression is that this number would be bigger in the United States than it's been in Europe. And by the way, everything we say about the economy hinges on uh, what we say about the virus. And unfortunately, my understanding is the situation is still very uncertain. We know that the vaccine may come. We don't know exactly when. Some people say by year end, others say in the spring next year. But then the distribution times, the actual coverage of this vaccine, the quality of this coverage, the length of time this protection will last. My impression is that there will be question marks in the future. And so until people uh, get full confidence, you will hardly see a recovery, a full recovery taking place. So even if we have a vaccine, but this vaccine is kind of temporary, partial and so on, people will still be fearful of doing certain activities. So it's gonna take, uh, I think recovery is gonna be bumpy. It's not gonna be a linear process that we, we all believed it, to, it would happen in March or April, it's now, uh, by the way, even in June, we were observing it was not going to be a, a linear process because after the initial bounce back, we saw that this recovery was losing momentum. And so it's going to be bumpy with lots of setbacks. And I'm afraid it's going to be long because confidence will need some time before being restored, both for consumers and for business. Yeah, I essentially see it the same way. Under even the best uh, reasonable outcome, this is going to be a long and difficult process to work our way out of it. And it's going to be determined 
you know, largely by our ability to uh, manage the virus and get to a situation where people are feel comfortable about resuming normal activity. Yeah. So we've got a, we've got a real challenge ahead of us. So let's move though beyond it. How will the world be different coming out of the pandemic? What do we need to do to make it a better place? Yeah, that's that's a that's a very difficult question. It, well, it's difficult because it, the more we go with this pandemic, pandemia, the more uh, we see that this has been a transformational change. Uh, there will be parts of the economy which uh, will actually thrive in the future, and there will be parts which uh, either will be downsized or, or disappear. And we don't, as I said before, we don't know how long this will last. So to make... Uh, kind of prophecies about how the world will look like, it's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's very difficult. But what one can say is that uh, we should avoid mistakes made in the past following uh, situations of deep crisis, of, extent, of a pandemia, and uh, actually in that case, there had just been a war before. I'm thinking about the aftermath of the First World War. And I think we should be basically mindful of that experience and keep our markets open and restore the multilateral framework that has accompanied us since the First World War, with where we have to, another thing we, we learned in the last, not only after the pandemic, actually, we, we perceived that, uh, that even about 10 years before, that globalization needs to be tempered, tempered by certain, by, by first of all, to take care of the profound inequality that's been generated in the last 10, 15 years, but also tempered with, with rules, which uh, would uh, be respectful of standards in different country. I think that's one thing we should strive for. And as I said before, growth will be the first imperative for economic policy everywhere. That is, I think, the most I can, I can forecast. To do more, it would be very difficult for me. Yeah, I think it'd be difficult for anybody, but I, I think you're right. You know, we, we need to restore global cooperation. You know, yeah. that's, that's critically important. So, Mario, this has been terrific. I look forward to the day when you can travel to the U.S. But in the meantime, we've got podcasts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hank. Thanks a lot. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.